609. Go ahead and stay seated and let's sing this. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere we go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing that again, and I'll put the right timing in there this time. I kind of jumped ahead of you. All right? Let's sing that one more time. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere we go. For it's a grand thing to follow Jesus in His army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. One page over is I Sing a New Song. And we have to have uh, most of us singing the bottom part and then uh, some ladies, if they want to sing the upper part there, uh, the refrain on that. So everybody, uh, if you don't know what the rest of it is, sing the bottom line there. I sing a new song since Jesus came. I sing a new song, it's Jesus came, serve a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new All right, I'll be listening for you. All right, one more time. Same thing. If you want to sing the upper part, you can do it. Ladies, everybody else on that bottom part there. I sing a new song.
say, I don't know that. I don't think I do either. But I figure we ought to learn a new song every once in a while. Is that a little familiar to you, Nancy? We'll find out. Let's let her play through it. We want to live clean and then we'll take our offering.
Nancy. Let me uh, take care of a couple of announcements before we let our young people go tonight. Uh, just a couple of things tonight. The uh, guys that are running the soccer camp are doing some things with the teens. And tomorrow night, anyone who wants to come and just do a soccer match, uh, guys, girls, old, young, just come on out and uh, enjoy the evening there. I think it'll be uh, fun. And then on Friday, there is a teen activity. If teens, the teens want to come, uh, pizza and paint. We want to paint some chairs down in the, the uh, cafeteria. And I learned that when they were originally painted, Susan Kearns painted them. So that was about 50 years ago. Uh, you know. Yeah, 48. <laughs> um, but they need painted again. And uh, we wanted to, to see if our teenagers would help us. So 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll have pizza for you, so if you'll come out uh, at 11 o'clock, it uh, should take an hour and a half, two hours, and uh, we think we can get that all finished uh, on Friday. And then uh, on Sunday after the evening service, we do have a deacons and trustees and wives meeting. And then the uh, building, uh, you can't really see a lot of work's been done, but unless you go out there, you can't really uh, tell, but we've had a faithful group of men who've been out there and uh, working to get the rebar in place. And then yesterday, um, probably five, six, seven uh, trucks were here with concrete. There's a lot of concrete in that um, foundation. And so uh, about 75% of that is poured. There was some on a corner that was still too wet to uh, finish, but that's been finished now and they're supposed to finish pouring the foundation tomorrow. And the next two things that we are uh, doing ourselves uh, we have to complete the pillars, and you guys who have done that, we have to build the rest of those up, and it's where the, uh, we'll put the pins in where the, the uh, steel girders will go, and that's what holds the building up, and so uh, we'll do that, and then after that, we'll do the groundwork, so we'll put some uh, pipe underneath the concrete, and uh, then we'll put uh, the uh, gravel down and get that all smoothed out for the uh, concrete to be put in. Uh, so Dave is planning to work on that the next two nights. Um, so if we have some men who could come out either of the next two nights, and if we don't get it finished, then we'll, I think Dave's planning to work on uh, Saturday morning. And we're trying to get kind of a little ahead of this where we can put something out and say, All right, here are the times when we need help, but we know that we need some help Thursday night, Friday night, and possibly Saturday uh, morning. So if any of you could do that, uh, if you can come one of those times or two of those times, uh, it's a big help. If you, if you say, I don't really know what I'm doing, uh, that's fine. Dave is great at teaching uh, people how to do that. So Darcy's pretty much an expert now. So yeah, he's 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 a good worker. I've been impressed with him. He's yeah, so by the time he's done, he'll be ready to build another building. So he's he's ready. Uh, but any of you who want to help, uh, either the next two nights, Saturday morning, and I'll let you know about Saturday morning. It'll be in the email Friday. But we definitely need some help on on those things. So uh, if you want to come out, you're welcome to. If you are three years old through the third grade and you want to go to the Summer Kids Club, uh, Jocelyn is back there. She'll be taking you tonight. And then fourth uh, through sixth grades, if you want to go to Bible Quizzing with Mrs. Laux, uh, you can go with her. And the rest of us, we're going to turn to 1 John chapter 2. We started our Wednesday night study uh, about two months ago, and we started in this passage that we're coming back to tonight. And it's 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And as we get back here, uh, we're going to spend some time in this tonight, and then we'll tie it all up next week so that you'll understand uh, what all of this is, is pointing to when we get to this passage. And there's a specific definition that we want to walk away with this evening, and you'll understand what that is. Let me just remind you that as we've gone through this, we have learned that the Scripture expects us to make application. Uh, you are going to see that in evangelicalism, there's this pressure that if the Bible doesn't specifically say something, then you can't really put a, a boundary on it. And that's, that's foreign to the Scripture. It expects us 
to take biblical principles and make application in our daily lives to restrain our flesh. And so we looked at a number of uh, passages of Scripture that show that to us. And then we've asked two particular questions that we spent a lot of time answering. And the first one, uh, is there a command to be holy? Well, when you start looking at the Scripture, it is absolutely clear that we are to be holy as God is holy. As he which in, in heaven is holy, we're to be holy. And that is uh, a high standard that he puts before us. And so we need to make sure that we understand who God is. The more we understand who God is, the more we'll understand about the holiness that he requires of us. Second question was, is there a command to be separate? Uh, should we ever separate ourselves from either a brother or unsaved people? And absolutely, when we come away from Scripture, the answer to that is yes. In this particular passage that is up there, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he uses the illustration of being yoked together. And there are certain things that you don't yoke together. And of those are belief and unbelief, Christ with Belial, and he says that we are to make sure that we are not yoked with those, and he specifically says, wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And his point there is that we are the temple of the living God, and that is that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us like the Old Testament temple. It was to remain pure and undefiled. There was to be nothing impure in there. And other passages teach us that we are to extend that to separation even from uh, brothers who walk disorderly and not after the traditions or the commandments that were given. If they're failing to listen to biblical truth and refuse to do that, then we're to separate from them. Now, there was a qualification there. We're not to treat them as an enemy, but we're to win them back. We're to love them and try to help them. But the important thing is that we don't become like them. And all of us are pressured to do that. Even parents will be pressured to do that. Your children will stray, and the pressure is that you accept what they're doing and that you become like them. And what we are to do is to love them back to truth, to holiness, so that they will live for the Lord. Well, here's the third question that we ask in looking at this topic. And that is, is there a command to abstain from worldliness? Now, as I said, we started with this passage, so I think you know the answer to that is yes. But there are some specific details that we need to flesh out of this. So let's go back to this. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 15. 1 John 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Um, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of or from the Father, but is from the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Now, uh, you might remember that as we started this study, what is the word that we really need a definition of in those three verses? What do we need to define? The world. What is the world? What does that mean when we come to this passage and it says, um, and I believe it's six times in here, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the love of the Father, uh, is, not, uh, is not of him, it's not from him. So what does he mean when he says the world? Um, I'll give you a little bit of a, a clue. If you were able to read Greek, it wouldn't help you a whole lot. There are actually two words that are used for world in the New Testament. One is cosmos. Uh, we actually get the word cosmetic from it. And there's the word eon, which we get the same term from. And eon is an age. And it's the idea of this world or this age. And those are used interchangeably. There are some distinctions within them, but they're used interchangeably. And they are used both for the physical world and they're used for this term here. And he's obviously not talking about the physical world that we have. There's an ideology behind this. 
And that is what has been uh, really cast out by many people who are Christians today. They've lost the idea that there is worldliness, that there is a flesh that we battle against, and because they've thrown that out, they really don't see any reason to change their lifestyle or require any change of lifestyle in people. So, we need to find out what is the world. And when I do something like this, I'm always worried that I'll bore you. So tonight, if you get bored, you know, snore real loudly so I'll, you'll know that I'm really putting you to sleep here. But I've got to do a little bit of a study on this before we can really get uh, what this means. And so I did what every good person will do. I asked some other people. And I asked some people who are smarter than I. So I got the books off the shelf and started looking. There's a book called The Dividing Line by Mark Sidwell. Very good book, an excellent application of truth. Here was his definition of the world. He said, it's an attitude of friendship toward, a desire for, and a wish to be recognized by the world system. It is sometimes used of the behavior of people characterized by this inner attitude. Now, I read his definition, and he uses that definition several times, and the only thing I could think when I was finished with his definition was, I don't really know much more than when I started. Because he uses the world system to define the world. And so we needed to know what is the world system. But he does have some uh, particular things there that are important. Worldliness... Uh, used to be, and, and I would say this is really not true for younger people today, but it used to be defined by what you did. So in churches, and when I got saved and started going to church, you would define a worldly person by what they did. You'd look at a person and say, that person is worldly. And, and back in, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, what were some of the things? We kind of touched on this, but what were some of the things that would have told you this person is worldly? Can you help me out with any of that? Yeah. Lois? Dancing. Yeah, dancing. Yeah, that's worldly behavior. So if somebody was participating in dancing, definitely this person's into worldly, they're worldly. All right, I heard some other things. All right. The way you dress, yeah. Um, you know, mini skirt or whatever the, the fad was. If somebody came into a church dressed a certain way, you would say that person is worldly. Okay? Um, anything else? Give me one more. Drinking. All right, drinking. Yeah, this person's worldly. They're involved in drinking. Now, the fact is, that's true. Uh, you can look at what a person does and they are worldly. There are worldly activities. There are things that a person do that you could look at and say, that person is caught up in worldliness. But let me ask you this. Could there be people who have no outward manifestations of worldliness that are still worldly? Absolutely. Worldliness is manifested, it's demonstrated by the fact that you do certain things. But that's not really worldliness. What's important in this definition that's up here right now is that his first word describes worldliness. It is an attitude. And it's an attitude that will be reflected in actions, but worldliness really is a way of thinking. We might even call it a worldview. It's a way of thinking. And so in his definition, it is, a def it is an attitude of friendship toward, an attitude of a desire for, and a, want, a desire, a wish to be recognized, and here's where his definition falls short, by the world system. Well, what is the world system? Uh, we have to refine that a little bit to try to figure out what he's talking about. And so while it's, it's sometimes be, uh, evidenced by behavior, we need to go a little bit deeper in the definition to figure out what is it that, that still we define as worldliness. So go to the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, and we can add a little bit to this. It's, it dis defines it as an affection for that which is unlike God and contrary to his will. Right, that has some good components. And obviously, I picked these because they have some good components to it. And so, as you look at this definition, it's an affection. You have a love for that which is unlike 
God. We've already studied the idea of holiness, and so that fits very well for us. I find things that are not like God, and I have an affection for those things, things that would be contrary to his will. So if I find something that is God's will, a worldly person will have an affection for that even though they know it's not God's will and even though they know it is unlike God and that doesn't manifest his holiness. Okay, we need to make an application there. We've got to get the rubber on the road. What are some things that would be, uh, let's use the, the second part of that, contrary to his will. What would be something that a person would do that, that we could clearly say is contrary to the will of God? Andy? Cheating other people. Cheating other people, yeah. Contrary to, clearly violates biblical principle, okay? And they might develop an affection for that, okay? Anything else? Bill? Legalism or self Okay, legalism or self-righteousness. It's not God's will for you to be in self-righteousness nor legalism. So you have that. Okay, anybody have one more? Uh, Lois? Well, gossiping. Or All right, gossiping. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any of those, clearly not God's will. If we look specifically for activities that are wrong, you can put immorality, sexual immorality in that. Uh, you can put uh, viewing television where it's just immoral. Um, language, that would be problematic and it's clearly not God's will. But you develop an affection for that. You get caught up in that. All right, let's move on to another one. D. Edmund Hebert is a commentator, has written some excellent commentaries. He has one on 1 John, the Epistle of John. How well you can read that. Um, as he's writing on these verses, he says worldliness is used to denounce everything from buttons to beer. I thought that was kind of an interesting statement. If you go back through history, everything has been called worldly. Buttons were called worldly by whom? The Amish. Yeah. And here's where we do run into problems because the Amish have, have taken this idea and they've really run with it. We don't want to be worldly. And so they don't ride in cars, or they don't own cars. They actually ride in cars, but they don't own cars. They won't have a, a phone in their house. Uh, some of them wouldn't have buttons on their clothes because that was worldly. Then others wouldn't have a zipper because that was worldly and they had to have buttons. And so this idea of worldliness has been used to prove everything from beer to buttons is wrong. So we gotta really figure this out. So he goes on then and he says, if you understand this word correctly, and he's a very good a he, a Greek scholar. He's a really a, a, a high level um, intellect here. <clears throat> he said this word basically denotes order and arrangement, hence an ordered system. By the way, that's why cosmetics are called cosmetics, because you're trying to get what in order? <laughs> You're trying to get your face in order. <laughs> so here's cosmos, and that basically is the idea of we have something that is orderly, something that has a very specific arrangement. It's an ordered system. This adds a big part to the component of worldliness. Worldliness is not a disjointed uh, idea that's just out there in the midst that we have to hope we get to. It is actually an ordered system. It is something that is an arranged system. And so we, we find a, a good step here into figuring out what worldliness is. What is the order arrangement here? He goes on, uh, predominantly, worldliness predominant, predominantly has an ethical import. Uh, don't worry about that statement. The human race in its alienation from and opposition to God. So its import, where it gets its real fire is that it's alienated from God. Its disposition, its opposition to God is where its real system comes from. Now think that through because what we're saying is that the orderliness of the worldliness is based upon the fact that we oppose God. We don't want him telling us what to do. And so worldliness is based upon the fact that I'm, I'm alienated from God, I'm separated from Him, and I don't want Him telling me what to do.
This is all going to tie together here in just a minute. So when we keep going, let's put another commentator up here, uh, Candlish, commentary on 1 John. He said, the order of things very thoroughly complete in itself, or it's the order of things very thoroughly complete in itself. And, and the point of that is it's an orderly thing. He agrees with this other commentator, it's an orderly system. Now, I underlined here this middle part because he explains it as fallen human nature acting itself out in the human family. That's what worldliness is to him. It's the fallen human nature acting itself out in the human family. And again, we have the idea that this is man alienated from God. He's molding, and I know that's spelled wrong in our language, or, or today, but that's, Candlish was an old writer, molding and fashioning the framework of human society in accordance with its own tendencies. That is that the fallen man, he's just acting like a fallen man. He's doing what he wants to do. He goes on to say, it is fallen human na nature making the ongoings of human thought, feeling, and actions its own, apart from God. It is the reign or kingdom of the carnal mind, which is enmity against God. It's the enemy of God and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So this really is a great understanding of worldliness right here, although it's a little wordy for us. But it is really the idea that worldliness is an orderly system and it's a kingdom of its own and it really is a kingdom of people who are separated from God, who are determined to do their own thing, not according to the laws of God, not letting the laws of God bind them to do their own thing. Boy, do we have any examples of that today. You know, Virginia's marriage amendment just got uh, struck down this week, voted on by the people, yet the courts say it's not right. Well, there is a perfect example across our nation here are people who have said, we do not want to be bound by the laws of God. We, are, we have no interest in doing what God wants us to do. That's really worldliness at its extreme. Because they've said, we're not going to be subject to the law of God. And because we're alienated from God, we really can't be. We are so indebted to please our flesh, we're going to do it. Regardless of what happens, we're going to continue to act that way. Now, that gives us really a great idea of what worldliness is. But I want to take one more uh, little stab at it, and I want you to get a little more of a history of it in your mind as well. And, and you need to understand what worldliness is to make application here in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. There's another book, and I have it up here with me. It's just a, a little book, but it's written by Randy Leedy, and it's called Love Not the World. And really, it's a book that's based on these verses. And as he writes this book, he comes to a definition. Now, uh, I actually know Randy Leedy, and he is the brainiac. Uh, if you want to read the book, you feel free to read it, but be well rested when you read it. Uh, he goes back to the Old Testament and says, okay, if there's worldliness in the New Testament, I think we're going to have to define it by going back to the Old Testament and asking, what was worldliness in the Old Testament? So what was it to be worldly in the Old Testament, and do we find the same thing in the New Testament? So I'm going to read a little bit to you, but, but here's the, the point that he comes to. When you read the book, and you, you actually get to page 50, and he comes to a conclusion. And when you get to that page, the idea is that if you go back to the Old Testament and start studying worldliness, you find that it is the term nations. Let me show you what I mean. Um, let me read this to you. As we begin to consider what the New Testament teaches about the fallen world, let us remind ourselves what we learned in the Old Testament about the nations in their rebellion against God. The nations originated in the, rebel, uh, in the rebellion of humanity against God at Babel in Genesis 11. Remember what God did in Genesis 11? He confused the languages. I believe that's probably where the races started. But here's man saying, we're, not ever gonna let, we're never going to let God destroy us again. We're going to build this tower. And God said, this is 
rebellion, much like in the days of Noah. I'm going to divide people up by language so that they can't ever organize themselves against me again. And man has been trying to have one world government since then. But God said, I'm going to confuse your language. I'm going to help you by doing that. As their history unfolded, they developed and engaged in all kinds of behaviors that our Father calls abominations. These are the nations. The stronger possible word to end, strongest possible word to indicate how intensely he detested their ways. The nations are therefore d destined for destruction unless they repent and return to the Lord. All right, one other question. Before, uh, let's say in the time of Genesis, before Israel is, is uh, formulated, what was it that the nations did that God called abominable? What were some of the things that the nations did? Not one right answer. What were some of the things that the nations did that were abominable? Uh, Amber? Say that again. Yes, there was long-standing in the, in the history, continues to be uh, sexual immorality. It was rampant among people. And, and, and when he saw that in the nations, uh, it was abominable to him. As a matter of fact, we have Sodom and Gomorrah, where we get sodomy from. The nations, apart from God, were immoral, absolutely horridly immoral. All right, what else? One other really big thing, a lot of other things, but one other big one. Wesley? There you go. They were, you could be a preacher, see? They worshiped idols, false gods. They had awful false gods. They would, would sacrifice babies to them in the names of their God. They would do all kinds of horrible things. And so the nations were characterized by immorality and they were characterized by worship of false gods, an absolute rejection of the Creator, and God was, it was abominable to Him. And as you come through the early chapters of the Bible, that's the picture that He gives us. He said, the nations are, are detestable in my sight. He destroyed them once. He, he confused the languages the second time to try to keep from having to destroy them again. And this was what was happening. And you could put other things in there. There was brutality. If somebody would have said that, that's another big item on the agenda when we look at the past. And that's becoming true of, of us today. Let me keep reading because here's what happened then, and this is how it connects to worldliness. Out of the nations, our Father called into existence a single nation through whom he determined to bless the whole world by setting into motion a plan of salvation for all who would trust in the Savior. That nation, Israel, would fulfill its destiny in part by refusing to imitate the pagan nations around her, displaying instead unqualified obedience to God's holy and righteous law. Israel, though, proved neither able nor willing to render such obedience. And instead, she developed an insatiable appetite for the ways of the nations and even for the worship of their idols. This appetite was irrational, given Israel's full knowledge of the abominations of the nations that were the very reason God had destroyed the Canaanites at the time of her conquest of the Promised Land. But Israel's lust was irresist as irresistible as it was irrational and down the worldly way she went. Now, you see the picture? Here is God giving us the picture in the early chapters of Genesis of what man is like apart from God. His behavior, his worship, it's totally skewed. He has to destroy man one time because the imaginations of his heart were only evil continually. And out of that, God created the nation of Israel. And he said to that nation, I want you to be the light that shines to all of these other nations. I want them to look at you and see God. And God gave them law so that they would know exactly how to obey him. He showed them how to worship him in his temple. He set up a priestly system and sacrifices for them to do it. I mean, he gave them specific, detailed instructions on how to live 
and how to worship. Now, what happened? I'm hearing myself twice, Eric. <laughs> but, you know, there could be good things in that. Although, maybe I'm going crazy, too. <laughs> when, uh, when, when Ezra was supposed to do that, then what happened? They're supposed to be this bright light. Who do they want to imitate? The nations around them. You come to the time of Samuel, and they say, we want a king. And why did they want a king? Everybody else had a king. That is the exact picture of what happens in the New Testament. Here is Israel, this tiny nation in the midst of a, a big world, and he says to them, don't become like all of the other nations. I've got you here because I want you to be distinct and separate. I want people to look at you and see me. Don't become like the nations around you. And oh, what a vivid description he gives here when he says, uh, Israel's lust was as irresistible as it was irrational. And down the worldly way she went until finally God had to let her go into captivity. And this was the picture that he used. Um, and, and so that is the basis of our understanding of what worldliness is in the New Testament. All the nations around them were doing things that disobeyed God's law and did not worship him and were, were against everything that God stood for. And so Israel failed to do that. Now, if we move to the New Testament, that's the same picture that he gives us when he talks about worldliness, that you and I are not to be that kind of person. And so with that in mind, we have this idea that he calls down and Randy Leedy gives us a, a brainy definition of it, all right? So here's the broad definition that he comes up with. The world is the totality of unregenerate persons living on the earth within some period of time, along with the habitual patterns of thought and behavior by which they express their ignorance and ins ignorance of and insubordination to God. Now, for our sake, I refine that a little bit. If you just put it this way, this is a really strong definition of the world. It is the habitual patterns of thought and behavior. Both are included, the way a person thinks and the way a person behaves. The habitual patterns of thought and behavior by which the unregenerate persons, an unregenerate person is an unsaved person, expresses their ignorance of God and their insubordination to God. Some of that is unintentional. It's ignorance of God. I don't know any better. There are some people who do things out of pure ignorance of God. They don't know that they don't know God. And so they just do things. There are some people who are insubordinate. They know God. They may have been raised in church and heard about God, and they express their insubordination to God by what they think and by what they do. And they say, I'm going to show God that I'm not listening to Him by doing these things and thinking this way. This is the worldliness that we're talking about. Now, let me uh, show you a couple other things here, and then, then we'll put down... A final definition before we get back to this and, and make some applications of it. We recognize that when we look at the world, we can see the evil in it, how it hates Christianity and Christians. There's a moral repulsiveness to the world in general. Uh, the world is self-focused. Bill mentioned that a minute ago. And uh, the root of the world's evil character is the fact that it doesn't know God and it doesn't want to know God. And so as you come to that, that place, you realize that here is a man expressing his lack of knowledge and his lack of willingness to surrender to God through his worldliness. Let me read this paragraph to you. Is there no such thing then as a worldly Christian? That conclusion does not follow, for we have seen that the scripture testifies, testifies repeatedly of the fact that God's people Though they, though they are not the world, nevertheless, are very prone 
to imitate the world. We have that example from Israel in the past. They were very prone to imitate the world. God repeatedly tried to keep them out of the nations, wouldn't let them intermarry, tried to have the borders set up, but they were prone to imitate the world. Hardly a more pitiful condition can be imagined as though a wealthy farmer's children would want to eat slop and wallow with the hogs. A good medicine for this condition is a prolonged meditation on our Savior's high priestly prayer for us in John 17. 17. He deals with that uh, after this, where, where Jesus prayed, uh, don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil. And it's the evil one there that would put them in the world. As he completes this, um, I thought you, uh, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to, to read for you. But you have to understand that <clears throat> When God tries to keep us out of the world, he's not trying to keep us away from pleasure. He is trying to keep us from destroying ourselves. And often that's what happens when we study worldliness and biblical guidelines, is we still in our fallen mind think, you know what God's trying to do? He's trying to keep me from having any fun. That's just the way we think, we really do. I'm not allowed to watch this television program. I'm not allowed to listen to this kind of music. I'm not allowed to wear this. I'm not allowed to have this hairstyle. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. And we look at it really as though God's trying to keep me from having fun. That's not at all what God is trying to do. When you study this from a broad perspective, you realize that God is trying to keep us from destroying ourselves. And when he says abstain from worldliness, it's because he loves us not because he's trying to make us miserable. He comes to a detailed theological definition, and I thought you would enjoy seeing this as well. Uh, the worldliness is a spiritual kingdom ruled by Satan in unremitting conflict with the kingdom of God, consisting visibly of the mass of living people who do not know God, and who, in response to satanic allurement, that plays upon and preys upon fallen human nature, corrupt the various aspects of God's earthly creation into avenues for the gratification of self instead of the glory of God, thereby incurring eternal judgment and destruction. Now, if you're gonna work with that definition, you're gonna have to have it written on, in a, paper, on a paper in front of you. But that is a really accurate definition. It is Satan organizing his people against God, against the law of God, against God's plan, to what he has here, the gratification of the flesh. I probably would have put the gratification of the flesh instead of the glory of God. I want to do what I want to do. And that's the definition. Now in reality, we're probably better to come back to this uh, refined, shorter definition. It's the habitual patterns of thought and behavior by which unregenerate persons express their ignorance of and insubordination to God. Now, I know that's a little deep, but there's not much of a way to get a more concise definition of worldliness. So I'm going to read it one more time, and then I want to go back and read these verses again to finish tonight. The definition is the habitual patterns of thought and behavior by which unregenerate lost people express their ignorance of God and insubordination to God. So how do they do that? Now, let's look at these verses again. Go back to 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. What he's talking about here is there is a contingent of people still 
that you and I have to recognize are worldly people. They live in this world, they're of this world, and that's all they have. And they have things that characterize them, and they're things that they do that define them as worldliness. And it's thought and action, thought and behavior, that we have to be concerned about. All right, I have to leave you hanging there a little bit. We're going to make some, some very practical application to this, but it's important that we understand the correlation between the Old Testament and New Testament, Israel and the nations and the church and the world. All right, so we're going to stop there tonight, and then we'll pick that up next week and, and uh, make some applications. So don't forget what I told you tonight, all right? Let's uh, pray, and then we'll pass out a prayer sheet. Lord, we thank you for the time, and we pray this evening that you will help us to be discerning. And Lord, I recognize this evening that as we study this topic, that it becomes very important for us to have wisdom and to have a real understanding of what you're teaching so that we can live in a way that would be pleasing to you. Thank you for your kindness, and I pray you'll help us to allow your Holy Spirit to refine us. In Jesus' name, 